All right, guys, welcome back to another Seek One episode, and welcome back to another broadhead test. You guys have been asking for us to do this again since we launched that last one last year. That video and, was a huge success. Yeah, tons of people were asking about what heads we're using since that test. We haven't really answered those questions because we still have a lot of testing to do ourselves to see what performs the best. So that's what we're here doing today. We're gonna do a penetration on bone test with a extremely slow motion camera. It's like 10,000 frames a second. Um, but before we go inside, I want to give you guys kind of a little background of where we are and why we're here and how we got here. It was kind of a, I don't know, a cool timing deal. So we were introduced to these guys from a family friend of mine and they manufacture suppressors and a lot of other products. They have like big military contracts. And so they invited Drew and I to come take a tour of the facility and you know, we do some hog hunting and stuff like that. So when we got here, like we were blown away at the, just like the amount of technology they have and our wheels got to turn them because following up on that broadhead test we were still testing a lot of things like wanting to you know find out what the best head was and when we started talking with him about it because we found out that he had this crazy slow-mo camera our wheels got to turn it on like maybe we can use them to create something crazy so we're kind of testing a lot of different things to potentially work on something that's not available on the market if we can kind of this is like the beginning stages yes. of us exploring into making our own head yeah and i mean th this company has all the potential to make anything we want when it comes to extremely precise metal parts which which is perfect for a broadhead so we're going to go inside and introduce you guys to kyle he's the founder of this company um and kind of give you a little background on who he is and then we're going to jump into the broadhead test Buckle up, boys. This one's gonna be packed full of science. <laughs> <laughs> oh, listen. All right. Hello. Hi. How are you? Hi. I'm well, my door survived. <laughs> <laughs> What's up? How we doing, boss man? How are you? Good, man. How are you doing? Good. Good to see you. This is our buddy Slade. Hey, hey man. Slade, nice to meet you, man. man. Thank you, sir. See what we brought for you. What's pretty crazy about this room is this this is soundproof, right? So it's all 98.9 percent .9 soundproof. Soundproof, yeah. yeah. So if you can, and y'all shoot 50 cals in here all day long. We were doing it yesterday. Can we do it today? Maybe. <laughs> One. We had a deer scapula get inserted into a one of these ballistic gel blocks. Trying to be as realistic as we can. Obviously, it's not going to be perfect, but is Lee, is Lee trying to talk science over here? I'm trying my best. I'm kind of hoping someone else will step in next. I am definitely the dumbest person in this room. I can promise you that. That's a good segue. Kyle, why don't you tell us what your background is? Then that'll make sense to why yeah. I'm the dumbest person in the room. <laughs> so background is I uh, went to college for mechanical engineering. So I've been a shooter my whole life. I hunted my whole life. Grew up around guns and bows and everything like that. And uh, Worked in industry a couple years. I worked in the nuclear industry. I did uh, a lot of robotic welding on the nuclear side, like uh -huh. repair, like in process. So while a nuclear power plant's running, we would go in and actually repair in process. So I spent a number of years doing that. Um, then got tired of working for other people and decided to want to do something my own. So I started the company as a side, kind of side business and worked two jobs for a number of years and got bigger and bigger and bigger and got into guns on the company side, like 2015-ish just doing stuff on the side and it got bigger and bigger and now we're we're here where we're 42,000 square feet, uh, 65 employees running two shifts. So you guys are one of the biggest or the biggest suppressor manufacturers? We're the largest suppressor manufacturer in the U.S.? Probably the U.S. if not the Western Okay, Atmosphere. and then you also do like very, um, I guess, precise metal parts for firearms and other, some other yeah, so automotive that's kind of, Yeah, that's kind of what our niche is, is very, very pre precision stuff. I've been a long range bench rest shooter my whole life. So that side of the gun gun world has kind of always interested me. Yeah. Um, so everything we do, all of our suppressor stuff is based on precision. Right. Accuracy, every, a lot of stuff we do is titanium. So super lightweight, um, high strength to yield ratio, um, very good to work with, but not your average suppressor. Right. Same with some of the weapon stuff we're working on, some of the coding development stuff, all that kind of stuff. We're we're completely the other way that the whole industry is going. Right. Uh, but we're bringing tech from other industries. You got to think the average firearms guy, they don't. There's no technology cross pollination. So if you work for Lockheed Martin, you don't go work for Remington or or Beretta or something like that. If you work for a firearms company, you don't go work for a petrochemical company or you know DuPont or something like that so 
the technology that you see in other industries rarely makes it in the farm right. industry or bow or hunting or outdoors industry like those those industries don't talk to each other yeah so kind of what we're doing here is we all have varied backgrounds from every other industry but firearms and we're coming into the firearms industry to try to do something different yeah, you see that in hunting big time mm -hmm. as well like i feel like it's so far behind the curve in so many ways anything that involves like technology especially electronics yeah it's so far behind the curve and there's so much opportunity there yeah. but kind of like lee said we came in here the first time we came in here we're, we're coming to talk about suppressors and like using them for hog hunts yeah and then you showed us this room you showed us the high-speed camera and then some of this like proprietary technology you have to make these super precise metal parts the coatings and we're like immediately is like okay broadhead the, we, the we wheels, start, broad the wheels start turning oh yeah. <laughs> yeah so to recap you heard kyle's background drew is an engineer at auburn scott who just walked out of the room is an engineer at georgia tech and i went to alabama so <laughs> what was your major I don't talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Environmental sciences. Yeah. Before we get into the test, I want to thank Clear Ballistics. Uh, they provided all these ballistic gel, ballistic gel blocks for us. They actually molded these deer scapulas in there for us. Um, they're huge hunters. Uh, they've done tests like this before. So if you guys need ballistics gel for anything, firearms, archery, any sort of testing, make sure you go check them out. We'll go ahead and link their website in the description of the video. <laughs> Y'all got any petroleum jelly to put on here? Smart people. This is not my what? Genius! That's why we get engineers around here. Can you explain the science Air behind uh, the lube for me? Yeah, so we put lube on the arrow because it was hard to get out last time. What actually ended up happening was we got a lot more penetration. <laughs> so we might be onto something early. For the, I mean, this is pretty common knowledge to most deer hunters, but the scapula bone is what is responsible. It's, it's the plate in the shoulder of the deer, and it's what's responsible for most shoulder shots that don't kill that deer. That arrow is not punching through that scapula bone and getting into those vitals, so. The whole point of this is to learn as much as we can, test these different styles of broadheads, and then use that knowledge to make the best thing that we possibly can. Yeah. Um, so there's a handful of different things, characteristics of broadheads that make it effective. Um, the one we're going to test today is penetration through bone, and this has been a, an extremely hot topic lately, partially because of the hunting public, ranch ferry, everyone's talking about single bevel versus double bevel, going through rib cages, shoulders, um, and in and my we, opinion, we we just had a bad experience yeah, with we've had Kimball's a deer on an expandable, so yeah. it's bringing this you know more as like an important thing for us to kind right. of work on. So this is that's the first characteristic we're going to knock out and test. There are others that I feel like are equally as important or potentially even more important than that penetration on whitetail hunting. Yeah. Um, those being the char characteristics of the flight I think is really important. Um, how consistent it is, how accurate it is, and how forgiving it is if you have any sort of hand torque on your bow because yeah. I mean not everyone's a tournament archer and shoots perfect form every no, time. No and, and when you're in the heat of the moment when a deer's in front of you and your adrenaline's pumping like you you can't be expected to have right. exact perfect form. So we so. have some pretty cool tests set up in the future for testing those characteristics. The other one is how much damage do these broadheads inflict and that's been a, a check mark in the mechanical box for just cutting this huge hole in these deer. Um, and I'd say that's a downside of some of these fixed blade, uh, two blade, single bevels. They don't have that much cutting diameter. So we're gonna do more extensive testing on those characteristics. This test does not give us what the best broadhead is. Mm -hmm. It simply tells us First step. which one penetrates bone the best. Yeah. So that's what we're trying to figure out today. We've got five different heads, got five blocks with scapulas molded into them. And we really just picked five heads that have different characteristics to them that will penetrate bone differently. And so I'll go ahead and introduce you to the heads that we picked. First one is the Q80 Exodus three blade. This one performed really well in our first broadhead video test. If you haven't seen that, we'll link it below. Um, this is the only three blade we're gonna do in this test. Next one, and this is a head I've been shooting a lot the last year or so, is the Cutthroat. And this is the only single bevel we're gonna use in this test. Next one is an Ozcut Elite Series. This one is just a similar profile to that cutthroat, except it's a double bevel blade. 
then the Day6 Evo. Similar profile to the Ozcut and the Cutthroat, but it's got bleeder blades and arguably a sharper point on it. And again, that's going to come into play when we're talking about splitting bone versus just cutting and sharp penetration. We'll talk more about that soon. And then last but not least, potentially Lee's favorite, the Rage Tripan. And in our opinion, this is probably the best mechanical. I think it's we, the best expandable. We have a, One of the best expandables. Yeah. And it's the most <clears throat> popular expandable. So, But like I, I said, we just had a horror story happen yeah. with that exact head. So. And Jay had the same thing happen two years ago yeah, in Nashville. Tennessee. Yep. So the plan is we're going to shoot each one into the block, and we're going to look at how the bone splits on the slow motion camera, and then we're going to measure the penetration after the scapula. Let's shoot some heads. All of the arrow setups I'm shooting today are 565 grains uh, with a 125 grain head. So 565 is a total arrow weight. Shooting out of a 70 pound Hoyt Venom. First shot is the QAD Exodus. Next up, shooting the single bevel cutthroat. Next up is the Ozcut Elite Series, double bevel. One. Next up is the Day6 Evo. Last but not least, Rage Tripan. Three, two, one. And the blades didn't open up. I think the Coriolis effect is playing a big role in today. Yeah, definitely. I can feel it. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like that one. <laughs> so just an initial kind of look at this. The QED Exodus got the most penetration. Then next was the Day6 Evo. Maybe like an inch and a half less than the Exodus. And then the Ozcut was in third the cutthroat fourth, and then a very long distant fifth rage tripan. The Exodus is the, the head that won the penetration test in our last video. And I think a big part of that is it just creates a big cavity and moves that gel away from the arrow shaft as it's penetrating. I would be interested in seeing as if you tried to shoot it higher, higher, higher up, thicker part of the bone. Yeah. And see if you get a, like a side deflection or if you actually start getting either breakage in a tip yeah. Uh, or it just shatters. Well, let's uh, get these out and get another shot. See if we can't get in that thicker part of that bone. <laughs> Can you, you mind doing that here? <laughs> Ready? Yeah. That's amazing. Three, two, one. Cut. Next up, day six Evo. We're shooting the Rage Tripan next, and this gel is not firm enough to make the blades deploy, so we're putting cardboard in front. That tape doesn't work at all. Making sure those blades open, and the SpongeBob tape is not very sticky. One. Wow. Woo! All right, so that is a perfect example yeah, of a yeah. shoulder shot that would not kill a deer. So that scapula 100% stopped that expandable. Yeah, it deployed. Oh, man, look how big of a cavity. He's gonna have a limp. Yeah. First one's out. That's the cut through it. The Exodus completely blew this bone apart. This is barely. It's really not even attached. The gel is holding it together right now. I'd say that's pretty conclusive. <laughs> yeah. So if you look at it compared to those, yeah. 
you have to push something that's twice as wide using the same amount of muzzle energy. Mm -hmm. So it'd be the same as like you look at expanding bullets and rifles, like 300 block out, you can get a, a round that expands this big, super shallow, but it'll cause a lot of carnage. Mm -hmm. These are, they're fixed and it's, a, it's an, essentially a shallower or narrower wound cavity. So all that muzzle injury is gonna go further because it has, the arrow has to do, or the arrowhead has to do less work. Let's look at the three fixed blade, two blades first, and you can queue up the cutthroat video. The reason I chose these three is there's been a huge, I wouldn't call it a debate, but it's just kind of uh, some knowledge that's kind of come back to the forefront. The Ashby reports have been talked about a bunch, but the single bevel style head, which means the blade is only sharpened on one side and then on the opposite side on the other blade. And essentially what that does is it, it causes rotation as it goes through dense flesh. And what that's supposed to do when it hits bone is cause like a prying action to pry that bone apart and open up the channel through the bone more so than just a double bevel, which creates a bigger cavity for the arrow to pass through like Kyle was saying. The test that we just did, it's, in my opinion, it's not conclusive between these three because I just think there's too many variables. The bone is really too thin to kind of have one fail or one perform worse than the other. Um, so I would like to do a more controlled test with these three just to see if there really is much variance uh, with that single bevel and the double bevel. The other part of that penetration and bone splitting um, kind of argument is that most of these single bevel heads have a, a tanto style point, which is more of a blunt point, as opposed to like the day six right here. It's a very sharp, uh, tapered point. And essentially what that does, it's the maul versus the ax kind of theory with cutting wood. Whereas this is an ax, it's meant to cut and penetrate into the wood to cut a tree down. The maul is more blunt force. It's splitting the wood apart and it's not meant to penetrate far. So. The reason I chose this third third head, the Ozcut, is it's a double bevel, but it still has that Tanto style point, which kind of acts as the maul. And I wanted to see if the maul effect or the single bevel effect is what's causing the bone to split, which you can't really tell on this test. I mean, they all got pretty equally destroyed. Um, so I would say this part's inconclusive, but the other two, we definitely have some re results that we can do something with especially on that mechanical head. Yeah, I think, I think the mechanical just proves what we already knew, which, I mean, it, it, it causes a lot of devastation, but it, you're not gonna be able to punch through bone. Yep. And I've shot, we've, we've all shot deer in Atlanta that have had markings on their shoulder with their, where they've been hit in the shoulder and has not killed those deer. Mm -hmm. And if they're shooting a style of head where they can actually punch through that, I mean, that deer probably goes 30 yards and piles up. Yep. So the question with that becomes, what's more important to have cutting diameter and hope that if you miss the vital as you're hitting, you're missing back behind the shoulder and just causing as, as much devastation as possible to hopefully recover that deer. Or if you miss forward, do you want to be able to penetrate the shoulder? So that's kind of where the argument between the mechanical and the single, the single bevel or just any fixed blade head kind of comes into play. Are you going to miss forward or are you going to miss back? Yeah. And so I, mean, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that I don't either. I mean, yeah. there's, there's pros and cons to each. Yeah. You know, I've, I've had a rage screw me when I've hit too far forward. I've had it save me when I hit too far back. Mm -hmm. Where it gets really fishy, though, is if you hit a rib, which we've had, the rage hit a rib, it doesn't Multiple penetrate, times. and that's not acceptable. Yeah. Multiple like times. that. If you're gonna hit, if you're hitting in the vital zone and you hit a center punch a rib, you have to be able to punch through. I don't trust expandables with angles. That too, yeah. Across the board, I just don't. I don't trust them with any sort of quarter way, quarter two angle on a deer. I've just never. I've had my best success with an expandable when they are pretty much dead nuts broadside. Mm -hmm. So. Then once again, the Exodus. We got bits and pieces. Yeah, that one did some what's, devastation. What's left over? The second shot is what really blew this thing apart. And I mean, we're just like straight up giving Exodus some free advertising here again, which we have zero affiliation with them. But yeah. that three blade head, I think just cuts that bigger wound cavity, yeah. allows the arrow to pass through it without as much friction. 
and it's just it's blowing this at like the bone apart. It kind of gives you the apart. best of both worlds. Yeah. So you get the penetration depth and you got the bone breaking capability of uh, a two blade, but you get wound cavity size. I mean, again, you're punching a, a one inch diameter hole through whatever you yeah. shoot, bone, flesh, doesn't matter. I mean, me personally, I would rather go for something that'll cause cavitation no matter what, mm -hmm. versus that way, if you're, and what if you're not shooting deer? What if you're shooting elk, shooting mm -hmm. caribou, or something with bigger bone mass and thicker or higher density bone? you're gonna be safer with something like this, but right. again, that's very hunter specific and animal specific and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, so if you start getting into the, the bigger game, elk, bears, yeah. whatever, then I'd be curious to see if the, the uh, single bevel fix is better than yeah. that. Or and I would assume this is gonna penetrate bone better than that, but sure. that's only if you straight up just like center punch a bone yeah. and you're not, that's not what you're trying to do. Lower, but you so, got tougher hide. There's a whole bunch of things. You start shooting do. boar and other stuff yeah. like that with really mm -hmm. tough hides. Yeah. And you know which one does better. Yeah. That's. So I think I mean I think this test showed us some things mm -hmm. at least for the mechanical, uh, for the three blade. It, I don't think it really tells us the whole story about bone penetration. Um, I think there's some probably a better test that we can engineer to kind of really dive into that more. But I feel like it's useful kind of direct us, directed us on the right path to start. Yeah. Again, without seeing this, thinking of what is the most general, all-purpose all head, whether you're shooting caribou, boar, tiny white-tailed deer, anything like that, yeah. what, what is going to be something that someone can buy that will work on pretty much anything they're shooting? Right. Yep. So, I'm pretty curious to see what you've come up with. Yeah, so I, I actually met with Kyle a couple months ago yeah. now and we looked at every I mean probably 25 different broadheads different styles and basically said here take these and just model something that you think would make the most sense um, so we're actually we're gonna look at those after we go walk through the facility a little bit and he's gonna show us some of these machines technologies that I think are gonna come into play making this head this is honestly one of the coolest coolest parts of this place and we're going to be using this thing a lot to kind of test designs prototype them and make tweaks to them without having to do like a full manufacturing process but Kyle can explain better what this thing is so this is a metal 3d printers DMLS direct metal laser centering uh, so a lot of people have extrusion printers at home where it extrudes uh, plastics and stuff like that and you have resin printers like form labs this uses powdered metal and it uses a laser so it actually welds every single layer together so it still builds like a regular 3d printer in layers but this uses metal powder at probably five to ten microns so very very fine metal powder it sweeps across the laser burns everything in in a, in a layer comes back up sweeps across drops down so it builds it 30 microns at a time we do 30 micron layer height but it builds it at a density within a percent of raw material. So like regular bar you machine it out of, this will build it within 1% of that. So 1% density. Within 1% strength? Yes. As just if you were to machine, machine it out of a solid, solid piece. Correct. We use it for prototyping on the government mill side and anything like that so that I can design on Monday, print Tuesday, and I can shoot it on Friday. And it gives me design validation so allows me to rapidly prototype very, very quickly without spooling up machines, anything like that. Now. It's great technology, production, it's not there yet. Right. It's not fast. Solely well, for prototyping. And prototyping, R&D, tweaking, ready. I can print five different versions of a similar design yeah. that have small tweaks. I'm not tooling up, I'm not paying for casting molds or injection mold or anything like that. And I can get near net shape within three to five thousandths of an inch. Anything really high tolerance, we'll print oversized or undersized, we'll do a little bit of post machining, but for the most part, I can pretty much use 98% of a part of the machine. <laughs> huh. Huh. Okay, well, leave that there. Okay. <laughs> a little subliminal messaging. <laughs> so we're running, running uh, fixtures and parts on this one. So this is a lathe, so everything spins like this, mainly round parts. This machine has two spindles, which allows you to essentially grab a part, pick it up, work on the other side, but it also has milling features, which means 
like that, that's a mill where the tool turns versus the part turning. That's kind of the difference between a lathe and a mill. This has both. This can do milling and turning in the same machine. So we can essentially get parts out of it completely finished. They can drop down, it has a conveyor system right there. So you can, you can do completely lights out parts with this machine. So this is our essentially coatings building. We, we have essentially stood up an entire coatings division um, that not just for firearms, but we do everything from knife handles to putters to gears and BMW race cars. Like we do a whole bunch of everything because the coating stuff and, the, and it's not even really coating, the, the material science side of the company is applicable to so much other stuff besides firearms. It's just firearms where we got started. Um, but we do a lot of other stuff for a lot of other industries. The equipment is very, very versatile in what we're doing um, and allows us to really change how people can look at manufacturing because we can take a less expensive material, harden it on the surface for wear, but allow you to easily form it or work it so you can keep your cost down. But Or you can give increased performance to your customer for very little increase in price without having to make it out of really expensive material. There's a lot of benefits you can do with, with Surface, you know, surface technology, material science, stuff like that, to give the consumer, give the end user a better product without having to essentially add tons of increase in cost. cost. This is the part that, like, I'm most curious about yeah. incorporating into a broadhead or even an arrow, just reducing that coefficient of friction as much as possible to see if that gets a lot more penetration. Yes. And, and the corrosion resistance that it has. Yeah, so the biggest thing we do a lot was corrosion resistance. Um, you know, salt spray is a really big test for stuff like that. Um, but corrosion is a big problem, specifically in firearms, but you look at other industries and other stuff where, again, you may not be able to use a lesser grade material. You may have to use a stainless instead of a carbon steel, but you don't want to use stainless because it's expensive, but you have to because it can't rust. So what we can do is essentially take a carbon steel and change the surface morphology and create a protective layer on the outside so it'll protect against corrosion and rusting and oxidation and stuff mm -hmm. like that so we can do that so you can use a mild steel part or a carbon steel chromoly for something you had had to use stainless in the past right so where i got the, i thought about for the broadhead application is you know carbon steels and other materials may actually be better for impact resistance right. fatigue but because Corrosion or oxidation is an issue. Everybody makes them on stainless. That's one of the, my big complaints with one of the popular broadheads on the market is that the the steel is great, but if it gets any sort of condensation on it, it immediately starts rusting. And it, as soon as the rust gets on the, the cutting edge, like yeah. you start losing sharpness. So stainless is great for the corrosion side. However, it's not hard. Right. So you lose you lose your edge very very quickly. You get really dull, or if you chip it. It just dents. It doesn't even really chip. It just kind of folds over and delaminates. So what we've been able to figure out how to do is take stainless and actually give it the same properties as hardened steel. So we can actually harden stainless so we get all the corrosion properties as well as all the hardness properties of, say, a, a carbon-based carbon steel. So we can build a broadhead that is as hard as one of your hardened tool steel grades but has will never, ever corrode or rust or doesn't matter. It can sit at the bottom of the ocean for 20 years never grow. I feel like it should stop you. I feel like we're giving away too many secrets right now. <laughs> <laughs> I go on for days. <laughs> long so, story short, long story short, there's a lot of technology here. There's a lot of stuff we can do broadheads. to make a better broadhead yeah. or a better product. Yeah. I want to go see the designs that you came Let's up with. Too. Let's go. Let's go. I'm, I'm dying to see it. Talk about the editing bay right there. That's V1. I don't, so I mean, do we, we want to show this? That's I the, don't know. We'll show it, but we may blur it out. Okay, so yeah. in a nutshell, this is a layman's man speaking. <laughs> <laughs> All the technology in this building is way above my head. Kyle's probably one of the smartest guys I know, especially from an engineering standpoint. And with what he has seen and what we've been working with him on, he believes that he is able to create a much more efficient and effective broadhead than what's currently available on the market. So that's essentially what our goal is here, what he's capable of manufacturing here. We're gonna put these at the ultimate test and he's actually showing us 
some of his his designs now that he's come yeah. up with. So. And so I wanted to like honestly, I wanted to give you creative freedom before we gave too much input yeah. and kind of see what you came up with, and then we're gonna come together as a team and be like, all right, let's tweak this here, that there. But uh, I'm probably gonna blur this out. I'm sorry, guys. Maybe in the next, <laughs> maybe a few videos down the road, we'll show you what we're actually. What the heck? That's I've never seen that before. <laughs> all right, explain. So. Thought so. You're free. You're free. <laughs> Fart smeller. What? <laughs> what? You never, Fart smeller? You never, you're a pretty fart smeller? No. You're, you're a smart free. feller? Oh. Fart smeller? Fart smeller. Layman's terms. Golly. Guy over here. <sighs> what would y'all do without me? I'm <laughs> right over there. Gotta lighten the mood. <laughs> See y'all later. See you, man. Thank you. My head hurts. Why don't you close it out? That's too much for us. Too much for me. <laughs> I, I'm curious. I mean, there's a lot of work. This is just a starting point. Yeah. Um, there's a lot that needs to be done here. There's a lot of tweaking that needs to be continued to just kind of worked on with the broadhead he's got designed. He wants to do airflow modeling, which he can actually like stick a broadhead in, have airflow going over the broadhead, and be like actually analyzing how the air flows over the broadhead, making sure that it would be stable in flight. Yeah. So, so that's the that's the next step, I yeah. think. The next test we do, I want to build a machine that we can shoot a bow consistently, and then apply different angles of torque to the handle, mm -hmm. and shoot different heads through, just to see how consistent and how forgiving they are in flight. Yeah. And then like pair that with a uh, airflow modeling, and I feel like that's going to give us a really good look at yeah. kind of how it flies, yeah. honestly. So I'm hoping at the end of all of this testing that we can come out with a broadhead that makes everybody here a more effective hunter including you guys watching at home you know i don't we we don't want to just come out with something that's just like oh it's just another if we get to the end of the road and we're like yeah it's not that special then we're just not we're gonna not make gonna it. make one yeah. yeah but if we come to the end of this road and we end up making something that's really really cool then 100 percent we would make yeah. it available to you guys so uh that was a lot of information i hope you guys enjoyed that we'll be doing more i guess another episode with kyle at some point kind of taking the next step but master class Masterclass is available. Yeah, so the Masterclass is live. Yes, it is pricey, but the reason that it's pricey is because the information that we're giving away in there, it's worth it. Um, I think there was a little bit of sticker shock when people were expecting it to be like 20 bucks and it was a couple hundred bucks. But um, again, the amount of time and investment we had to put into that, that price is, is what we come up with and it's, and it's a fair price. Uh, for the information that you're getting because also like that's something you take with you for the rest of your life I yeah. mean, we're giving away everything and you can use that information for all of your life to go get more more spots more spots more spots and more spots and do what we've been doing Save money on leases knocking on doors outfitters, all so master class is live we have the giveaway uh, live that's also in the link in the description we're giving away a limo we're giving away a brand new Hoyt bow we're giving away a brand new new canoe kayak to multiple of our subscribers, so be sure to subscribe now if you haven't. Stay tuned for that. I think we've covered it all. That was a lot of talking. Thank you. Thank it was a lot of talking. We appreciate you guys sticking along with it. And uh, see you next time. See you next time. Ready? Three, two, one. <laughs> oh my gosh. It smells kind of good. Oh, there she is. You didn't make it all the way through. Another bullet nail? Oh, gosh, you're okay. It's like it gets to that point, and now it's starting to break apart. Break apart. Wow. Cavitation yeah, bubble? Cavitation bubble. Ah. And, and you get a lot of light off cavitation bubble if you hit it hard enough. Yeah. yeah. Take Yeah. Or I thought Beaver was. Enough would not this want to get is, shot by that. So we're just playing the slow-mo back of the broadhead that we designed. Just did a little <laughs> testing. <laughs> the, the first the shot of the explosive broadhead. <laughs>